Hi there and welcome back to my channel. I'm Georgina and this is my art history series. Today we're going to talk about Caravaggio and his three paintings in the Contarelli Chapel. Two of them were painted in 1599 and the last one was completed around 1602. Caravaggio is one of Italy's most influential and most famous artists in the 17th century, but he's one of the least talked about today. He's someone who's credited with beginning the Baroque art movement, he was known for using prostitutes and dirty feet in his work, and he even killed a man. But how did this artist extraordinaire become famous? He was fairly unknown until he was asked to paint a chapel for the San Luigi de Francesi church in Rome. San Luigi de Francesi was built for the French community in Rome. One of their funders was Mathieu Contarel, a Frenchman known as Matteo Contarelli in Italy. He wanted to be buried in his church and so a chapel was built for him. He'd commissioned an artist, he'd given instructions of what he wanted painted, but then he died before the painting had been started. The Crescenzi family, an Italian family, was then given the job to carry out Contarelli's last wishes. They commissioned a sculptor to carve an altarpiece of St Matthew and an angel. All the scenes were going to be of St Matthew because the saint was Matteo Contarelli's namesake. An artist called Cavalieri del Pino was commissioned to do the paintings in the chapel, but he was so busy that he only had time for three small frescoes on the vault. By 1599, the church had been completed for over 10 years, but the Contarelli chapel still didn't have an altarpiece or wall paintings. The priests of San Luigi were fed up, so they turned to the Papal Commission for building projects, which had legal authority over estates. It's thought Caravaggio's patron, Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte, got him the job. He was asked to paint two scenes from St Matthew's life in 1599, and then got asked to do a third a few years later. And that's how the painter of Boys and Fruit became a heavyweight. The first of his works was The Calling of St Matthew. This is the painting on the left of the chapel. St Matthew has many names. He's called Matthew the Apostle, Matthew the Evangelist. He's the one who wrote a book in the Bible. And this is the moment he was chosen to become a disciple. He's also Matthew the Taxman to some people because that was his job before he became an apostle. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Jesus saw a man named Matthew at his seat in the custom house and said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed him. This painting is showing that exact moment. It's set in what seems to be a real room. And we could be looking at Caravaggio's own studio in Palazzo Madama. He lived there for four years after the Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte became his patron. No artist had much chance of success, or even very much chance of survival, at the end of the 1500s, unless he managed to turn himself into a bit of a courtier. Most did this by getting a patron, and that way they were attached to one of the great families of Rome. That's how you got the big commissions. The system of the free art market, with its dealers and galleries, was only in its early stages, and so to be a proper artist, you needed a patron. Someone who'd collect your work and help you meet the right people, who'd be able to commission other works. The Cardinal would probably have helped Caravaggio secure this gig for the Contarelli Chapel. So what can we see in this painting? Christ has come in on the right with an apostle, and he's thought to be St Peter. The composition is very typical of Caravaggio, because he's made the scene look very down to earth. And the only way Christ has been set apart from the men is by the extremely fine halo glimmering in the dark. There's a slight division though between the worldly figures at the table and Christ and St Peter. The figures at the table are wearing modern clothes, while both Christ and his companion are wearing classical drapery, which makes them seem timeless. The viewer tends to read the painting from left to right starting with the group at the table and then, like them, discovering the source of their astonishment when they finally see Christ. Both the central figures, Christ and St Matthew, are also quite lost in this painting. Caravaggio has resisted the temptation to put Christ in the centre of the composition, but he's not even in the foreground, 
All we can see of him is his shoulder, his head and his pointing hand. St Matthew is also not in the centre of the picture. He's not even wearing the brightest clothes. His young friend to the right is dressed in yellow. But both the main characters can be identified by light and gesture. The light streams in from behind Christ, presumably from a high up window which is out of frame. The beam of light moves from the upper right of the painting at a diagonal, so that Matthew's at the end of it, like money at the end of a rainbow. Christ's hand follows the direction of the light so that he's also pointing at Matthew. Light is always an important factor in Caravaggio's paintings. Here he's used it to show a moment of realisation. St Matthew and almost everyone in the room has literally and metaphorically seen the light. Their faces are all illuminated, apart from the figures who are still counting money. They haven't realised that Matthew's been chosen by Christ, and they're still focused on the earthly, not the divine, and so their faces are still in the shadows. Compare this painting to his later Supper at Emmaus, where Caravaggio repeats this trick with the light. In this story, Christ has been resurrected, but his disciples don't recognise him. This is the moment they've realised it was him. Both their faces have lit up, and even this man, who's got his back to the light source, has got his face lit up. Whereas the waiter, who's just come in, and hasn't had that same moment of realisation, is still hidden in shade. The gestures also clearly show who the central figures are, despite their strange position. Some scholars speculate that Jesus' hand is supposed to show him as the last Adam, or the second Adam, as he's called in the New Testament. This pointing hand reaches out towards Matthew, and it's almost a mirror image of Adam's hand in Michelangelo's The Sistine Chapel. That's the very famous one. In the New Testament, a comparison is made between Jesus and Adam twice. It says, just as though the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. So Christ as the second Adam is expected to correct all of the first Adam's mistakes. The other person who's pointing is St. Peter although he's slightly less enthusiastic than Christ, but he's still there. Peter was the founder of the church and he was the first ever Pope, and therefore he's standing between Christ and the humans, like a bridge between the two. Meanwhile, Matthew's pointing at himself, asking, what, me? He seems like he can't quite believe he's been chosen by Christ. Caravaggio is amazing at catching this high point of drama. Matthew's surprise at finding himself chosen is comparable to one of his early works, where a boy has been bitten by a lizard. He's just caught by a moment of surprise and pain. There's some debate over which man in the painting is actually St Matthew. Some writers think the bearded man is actually pointing to the young man at the end of the table, whose head's slumped but he's usually assumed to be the bearded man because that would be consistent with the other two pictures in the chapel, which both have bearded Matthews. It's probably also meant to be slightly ambiguous because Matthew's just a normal man, a tax collector who's been picked out of obscurity. His position even shows this duality. On the one hand, he's pointing to himself and on the other, he's still counting the money he's just collected. And the figures on the table show the same split, and it gives the impression they've just been caught in the middle of business. The young man at the end is counting the money, while the characters closest to Christ are having a moment of realisation along with Matthew. Caravaggio became famous for his realism. It might seem like an obvious concept to us to paint what you can see, but during the Renaissance the norm was to paint an idealised version of nature. Part of the reason Caravaggio became a realist was because he was poor. Not having a patron at first, he was forced to use models off the street, or even himself sometimes, painting from a mirror which possibly resulted in this distorted shoulder in an early painting. He's also quoted saying, All works, no matter what or by who painted, are nothing but bagatelles and childish trifles, unless they are made and painted from life. So that gives you an idea that he really valued realism. Everything should be painted from real life. 
Having a patron also meant you could be more experimental because collectors of art usually wanted the best talents and controversial pieces. They were always wealthy people and wanted to entertain their guests and they usually used art to be a talking point in the house. The figures in this painting feel really close and the fact the painting's cropped, we can only see part of Christ and St Peter, draws us into the picture plane. There's also a gap at the table, as though there's a space left for us, and this painting with its moment of high drama is meant to break down that separation between the real world and the composition. The central panel is also the last commission. This painting is St Matthew and the Angel, which Caravaggio did two versions of. The first was destroyed by a bomb in the Second World War, but the priests had rejected it anyway. It was considered inappropriate because it looked like Matthew was a stupid peasant with the angel teaching him his alphabet, and his bare dirty feet would have rested directly above the altar, seeing as it's a middle panel. The dirty feet was something Caravaggio was famous for. It was part and parcel of taking his models off the street, but it was possibly too realistic for a church setting. But mainly it's thought it was rejected because the angel is too sexy. He's leaning over the elderly man and whispering into his ear. Nonetheless, it was bought by the Marchese Giustiniani to go with his other Caravaggio painting, Victorious Love, another highly charged and erotic picture. And so Caravaggio did another version of St Matthew with the angel, and this one is a less risque version. The figure of St Matthew writing his gospel on the table has an antique seriousness to it. He could easily be one of the ancient Greeks, possibly Plato or Socrates. Again, the darkness around him gives those folds in his red toga a heaviness like sculpture. Matthew looks like he's rushed to his desk, his stool is wobbling and it looks like it's going to fall into the foreground, into our space. This draws us in because the picture's full of movement and again it captures that moment of action, like the first painting. Caravaggio was one of the first founding fathers of chiaroscuro, which is a painting technique, translates as light dark, and it shows the dramatic difference between light and shadow. This creates the impression that the bodies within the frame are very three-dimensional and have a realistic weight. The only other painter to notably do it before him was Leonardo da Vinci. The angel's drapery is part of this chiaroscuro technique. The folds are in shadow for an extreme sculptural quality. He belongs to an aerial space above St Matthew, and again St Matthew's face has been lit up with the angel's divinity. The drapery on the angel was probably inspired by a classical sculpture Caravaggio had seen in Rome where he lived, but there's also an idealised, arabesque look to it, like the ribbons in Raphael's Monde Crucifixion painted almost exactly a century before. Although most of the time Caravaggio was free to explore his realism, church commissions would have proved trickier. Conservative tastes meant they still wanted paintings with idealised elements, which would have felt out of date for Caravaggio, who was a very avant-garde painter. Something that does feel highly realistic though in this painting is the pose of the angel. His gesture is taken directly from the streets of Rome, there's no doubt you could see this counting gesture in a shop or a tavern. The panel on the right side of the chapel is the martyrdom of St Matthew. The commission caused Caravaggio a lot of difficulty, and this was his first painting of the series. He'd never painted on such a big canvas before, or one with so many figures in it. X-rays beneath the painting show Caravaggio made two separate attempts at the composition before doing this one that we see today. He had to reduce the number of figures and also scale back the architecture he had planned. He basically overcomplicated it. The painting is quite defining because lots of scholars say it marks the start of the Baroque movement. The period of art used movement, contrasts and surprise to create a sense of awe. This series of paintings caused a stir and the art critic Robert Hughes said this is the painting that made Caravaggio famous. The younger artists in Rome completely loved it 
and artists came from all over Europe to see it. This is the painting we see St Matthew being killed, so it's the end of the story. The story goes that the king of Ethiopia wanted to marry his niece, but St Matthew forbid the marriage. From what I can tell, the main issue is the fact the girl was a nun and, and St Matthew had converted her to Christianity. It wasn't the fact it was incest, but there we go, different times. Either way, the king of Ethiopia ended up killing Matthew and this is the scene. Despite it having been simplified, it's still an extremely busy painting. St Matthew is flinching as his executioner, who is nearly naked, is about to draw his sword and strike him. Everyone in the composition is reacting with different expressions, which is what the Cardinal Contarelli asked for. There's terror, amazement and horror, while the angel holds out a palm branch of martyrdom. The palm branch is associated with Jesus's triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, when in John's Gospel they took palm branches and went out to meet him. Because of this, the palm is usually represents martyrs in Christian art, and they're meant to show immortality and the victory of spirit over the flesh. The clever part of this composition, though, is that the angel and the executioner both have outstretched arms, and these lines are parallel to each other. This shows the direct relationship between Matthew's death, seen in the arm of the executioner, and his martyrdom in the angel's arm. But from the reaction of everyone else in the painting, Matthew is the only one who can see the angel. No one else seems to have noticed. He's reaching towards it, so this image becomes a transformation of him stepping into heaven. Baroque painting and sculpture of the time often showed martyrdoms as joyful experiences rather than scary death-related experiences. You can see this in Bernini's Santa Bibiana. The chaos is partly created by the chiaroscuro technique again, the dramatic contrast between light and dark. Some say Caravaggio used a high lamp to light up the murderer dramatically and left the other figures in shadow. As before in the calling of St Matthew, all the onlookers are wearing a mixture of contemporary and classical clothes. The executioner isn't wearing very much at all. He's wearing a classical loincloth type of get-up, and St Matthew's wearing some sort of ancient drapery. Again, this is bringing the scene into present day, and would have been a lot more relatable for the 17th century audience in Rome. Caravaggio has also painted himself in this painting. He's one of the onlookers in the martyrdom. It's partly meant to be a signature, but he's also painted himself as a witness. In a way, he's saying that he saw this scene unfold in his mind's eye as he painted it. And he also could be saying that he's partly to blame for St Matthew's death. Caravaggio's stripped semi-naked as though he's about to be baptised, but he looks like he's also about to run away. It's thought this self-portrait reads as mea culpa, it's my fault, and that he'd have had no more courage than anyone else in this situation. It's possible he's asking for forgiveness by confessing his weakness. And those are the three images which really made Caravaggio famous. Something else worth noting is that he used the church architecture in his favour. Small chapels like the Contarelli were dark and narrow. As Caravaggio's biographer Peter Robb puts it, anyone coming down the nave of San Luigi would have seen the pale killer nudes looming out of the dark. And it's still there today, so you can go and see it after coronavirus has happened. Go and see these works in San Luigi. Caravaggio changed the Western art world dramatically for a couple of centuries. He was truly one of the first artists to use the chiaroscuro technique, and the Contarelli Chapel was so extremely popular with young artists visiting from all over Europe that his influence can be seen across the continent until the late 18th century. And that's my analysis on the Contarelli Chapel. Hope you enjoyed it. Please could you make sure that you like and subscribe this channel. Free, feel free to comment down below as well. I'd love to hear from you and hear which paintings or artists you want to see here. See you next time. Bye.